after now, they are five male cheetah. Five. The fact that from what we've heard, these guys are incredible successful hunters. And we've already managed to see three takedowns all within kind of 24 hours spent with them. So a very formidable coalition. Not too much prey around in the immediate area, but that could change at any moment. We're in a little, it's kind of slight valley. And this is interestingly not too far away from where we saw them make a kill last week, Friday morning. They crossed a small riverbed, which is just behind us. And I fear they may actually want to cross that riverbed and head to the northern parts of their territory to go and check in to make sure there's no intruders there. They've been in the southern parts of their territory for about a week now. So I think they're heading north to check on things up there which means we'll have the help of some of the guides and other vehicles that are driving around this area. We have eventually managed to work out where they were. And I'm told a lot of you guys are really, really ecstatic about the fact that we've got some cheetah on screen. It's probably the least viewed cat on Safari Live, but we look to change that now that we're in an area with more cheetah. Now, I did mention that Brent is also gonna be out a little bit later. There's also Ali, who's gonna be driving around in a different reserve in South Africa called the Sabi Sands and that's a great place to see leopard. So who knows, we could see two of our spotted cats this afternoon if we're lucky. Hello to James. You're wondering if uh, when cheetah are greeting one another, will they purr? And I have spent very little time with cheetah, James, so I'm actually not too sure of that. And I personally have not heard any cheetah purring. They've got quite interesting audio that they make. So it almost sounds like video communications with and she's trying to analyze and work out what it is exactly that they are saying to one another. Um, I've only had brief encounters with her, um, so looking forward to spending a little bit more time with her and working out what's what. Now, on the horizon, there is a potential snack for these boys, just to the right there, to the right of the tree. Now, it's a long way off now, but anything could happen. That's a Thompson's Gazelle, and I'm not too sure if these guys will actually be hugely interested in Thompson's Gazelle because I think they have kind of specialized in hunting wildebeest. But the beauty of being out here is that you simply do not know what is going to happen at any moment. So there is some possible prey that could stir these boys up. Or they might, might just decide to go down for a drink in the riverbed that's just behind us, about 100 or 200 meters away. I'm certainly looking forward to seeing what they get up to a little bit later. It's only a matter of time until they get up. Hello to Enid, who would like to know a little bit about, uh, more about what would happen had, uh, had these boys decide to go and chase down a Thompson's gazelle or any other prey. Will they hunt as a team? Um, I guess they will. Um, I, Enid, I personally think people give uh, predators far too much credit um, regarding their strategies and planning with hunting. Um, and that's just my personal opinion. Often people will try and, you know, draw angles and lines and use these big fancy words to explain how the lions are closing in on prey with these precise pincer movements, but it's very, very seldom like that, at least as far as I've seen. And with these five boys, what I've noticed is that it's more likely Dave's going in to show, show him now. And all three kills that have been made in the time that we have seen them make kills, it's been him with the others following behind. Now that's not to say that he could chase one and another one could assist in the hunt, but I think it's more through default than kind of planned teamwork. They all just run after the best possible prey item. And if they're all chasing the same one through de default, then I guess it is teamwork. And there's no two ways about it. Having five of them together will increase their chances of bringing down prey, especially once the lead hunter has managed to latch onto it. So in this case, that individual who's got his head up now will be the one who maybe leads the charge, makes the initial contact with the prey, and then the other four come in and add muscle to the situation and try and help bring down larger prey items like fully grown wildebeest, which is quite a mouthful for these guys to take on, quite a handful for these guys to take on, yet they do it. So yes, there is teamwork, but I just feel that quite often people <laughs> overanalyze or overemphasize the skill of the predators, whereas to be honest, it's the skill of the prey who nine times out of 10 escape them.
Hello to Aaron. You would like to know how often will unrelated cheaters join up to form coalitions? And I think it happens fairly commonly, Aaron. Even this coalition here, we are told, one of the members joined most recently, the smallest one, who I think is the one that is closest to us, just in front of the, the yeah, well, the front one there. It's very difficult to tell them apart, but I think he is the smallest. And what one of the researchers told us is that if cheetah within 20 to 24 months of age come across another, so basically two years of age, if they come across another coalition of males, they can be accepted into it. They may, may get their fur a little bit ruffled up and there may become some kind of a skirmish initially, but if they are young enough, they can be accepted into a coalition. If they get older than two years or X age, then it'll become less and less likely for bigger established coalitions to accept younger males. So again, I think a lot is left unsaid, even within, you know, with all the researchers out there, there's a lot of missing gaps in terms of information on various populations and populations in different areas behave differently. But the more we, time we spend here, and with all your guys' help, identifying the different animals and keeping tabs on them and who's who and where they're moving, it'll certainly help us work out what happens with the future coalitions that may join or disband in this area. Hello to Laura. You would like to know if this coalition has a name. And we are going, we are trying to tread lightly with regards to names of animals at this stage because we just don't want to make any mistakes. So what you often find in most wilderness areas you go to is that one camp or one group of guides may call a coalition X name and the other camp down the stream or the other team of guides may call the same coalition something else. And we're not too sure exactly how many names there may be. We've already got misleading information for the name of the guy with the collar on. We were told it was Hunter by one person and Dartonian by another. <laughs> so we're still trying to work out who's who. But yes, the name, or one of the names I've heard of this coalition is called the Musketeers. That in itself can be confusing because there's also a coalition of lion in the Mara called the Musketeers. I guess a coalition of lion and cheetah are quite easily distinguishable though. But that's the state at the moment, the state of things. Hello and welcome to this afternoon's river cam session all the way here from the Mara River and that horrible scene that you're having a look at over there is a bunch of crocodiles that have got a wildebeest that they are busy dismembering. Now where they got this wildebeest I have no idea. They're, I've been watching this river cam the whole afternoon and unless a wildebeest came floating down which is I think what may have happened. Um, they definitely didn't catch it here. Quite often what happens is wildebeest will drown, they will uh, fall victim to other crocodiles upstream, perhaps even leopard or a lion dropped this carcass in the water. I'm not too sure exactly how this carcass happened, but the fact is that the crocodiles in this particular pool uh, have managed to zone in on this carcass and are now pulling it to pieces. Now, of course, crocodiles can't chew. Have a look at that crocodile in the center of your screen. You'll notice when he opens up his mouth that there are no molars there. They also, look at this crocodile coming up with big teeth, rips it out to the side of the slash, comes out of the water, and then swallows it down deliberately coming out of the water so they don't fill their tummies with, with water itself. We may even see, look at that roll. That is the only way that crocodiles can dismember a carcass. And look at that. Rips off a piece and comes straight in. The rest of the crocodiles now coming in. Isn't this fantastic? Now, you may have noticed that there was a little uh, banner that came across the screen there that says live from the Masamara and that is exactly it. Just like Scott is with those cheetah. This is happening right now on the Mara River here in southern Kenya in the Mara Triangle. This group of crocodiles busy tearing to pieces a wildebeest. Now yeah, look at that. Oh. Now yesterday we had about 10,000 wildebeest, perhaps even more than that, cross the river a little bit downstream of this particular crossing and what we saw was zero crocodile activity. What we think it is about is because the temperature, the, the water temperature and the temperature of the atmosphere has a huge impact on the activity of crocodiles. And below 20 degrees centigrade, crocodiles become virtually inactive. This is obviously not the same today. It's been a pretty warm day today. And you can see that these crocodiles are absolutely not inactive, gulping down massive chunks of meat and those are some enormous reptiles we're looking at crocodiles upwards that one on the right hand side there is probably upwards of 12 to 15 feet look at them coming up all the oh, excuse me there we go there's some birds that are looking for some scraps that is just me being a little bit ambitious with the controls and um 
the Kakanika area, two powerful males exert their rule over a rapidly expanding pride. With many mouths to feed, these lions specialize in killing Africa's most dangerous prey. But their feast turns to famine. Drought pushes their food source out of the area, leading to a ferocious confrontation with the neighboring pride. On the brink of starvation, they are forced to find an alternative, a dangerous strategy that will test their skill. This is the story of a pride in battle. At the beginning of summer, two lion brothers take ownership of one of the most sought after pieces of land in the, the view. No, crocodiles. Generally speaking, don't really eat fresh meat. Now, this is generally speaking. The Mara River, and especially after waiting almost an entire year for food, these crocodiles will eat fresh meat. Of course they will. But it seems to be the fact that most of these crocodiles will wait for carcasses to rot a little bit, making it easier for them to dismember, and of course tear into pieces like you're watching them do right now. Oh. Now, oh, hi, Bacon, you've just asked if crocodiles will feed on carcasses that they didn't themselves kill. Absolutely. They, this carcass, in all likelihood, floated down into this pool. The crocodiles in this pool zoned in on the smell of it. It is sufficiently decayed as to be uh, relatively soft, potentially. It is still the early season. These crocodiles have lost a little bit of weight over the last couple of months, waiting for the migration to come in, and so they will eat fresh meat. And now what they're doing is they're having a, a feeding frenzy, basically. But unlike you see of sharks or lions or even a hyena, I find that there's a certain balance. Just look at the power of that crocodile. Look at how enormous that guy is. That's a full-grown wildebeest, and that crocodile made the front quarters. Look at the head on that guy. That is amazing. There are a couple of giant crocodiles there. Look at how long that crocodile is. Just how he dwarfs the actual branch. One of the biggest crocodiles in this pool. Quite easy, could pull down a 400-pound wildebeest on his own. Obviously a little bit hungry right now. I've seen a picking order to these feeding frenzies. The biggest crocodiles get the, get the most food. Other crocodiles, smaller crocodiles and females, hang around on the periphery and snatch what they can. And there is no evidence of baby crocodiles in these pools. You're not seeing, you're only seeing big crocodiles like that giant over there. You're not seeing small crocodiles. I've got a funny feeling it's because small crocodiles will be preyed on by these big guys. And they, the smaller crocodiles have to make space and basically go and live in other places. Here he comes in over the top. Let's see what he's going to go and do. Asserting his dominance over here, puffing out his throat. This is amazing. Now, what makes me think this carcass came down the river is just look where it is. It's caught up on some branches in this eddy, a backwater, and there you can see the horns of the wildebeest. Wow, what an interesting sighting. Now, I don't notice this frenzy. This, this is a bit of a frenzy. I don't notice this on a fresh kill. Look at that mouth open. Isn't that the most terrifying thing? Big crocodile getting out of the way of another big crocodile. Obviously, that one more dominant, bigger, stronger. Who knows? That bird on the left-hand side, a yellow-billed stalk. Oh, whoa, whoa. What's happening over here? These crocodiles having a bit of a fight with one another. That is a big crocodile. Have a look at that. Posturing. Quite often, that is the case with these crocodiles. Now, Dennis, you wanted to know how many animals hunt crocodiles. That's a good question, Dennis. It's a, it's a, I suppose it's the same question as how many animals hunt polar bears or how many animals hunt lion or how many animals hunt great white shark or orca. Not very many. And that is simply because a crocodile is an apex predator. In this environment, he is or she is, they are the top of the food chain. And only scavengers and parasites and disease and viruses, I suppose, are, are they susceptible to them. And so nothing would hunt a crocodile in its full-grown form. Obviously, as a baby, just similar to sharks and, you know, lion and hyena and everything else, they will be preyed upon by almost anything, and anything will take the advantage of killing a baby crocodile just to limit the threat that they pose when they're a little bit older. But nothing in their big form, like this big guy here in the foreground, nothing except other crocodiles, starvation, drought, uh, exposure to extreme temperatures, or, uh, both hot and cold, disease, or serious injury, you know, from whatever would actually kill this crocodile. We can relate to that 
to a degree. Oh, look at the size of these guys. Now this yellow build stalk that you're seeing over here in the foreground. Oh, now Taryn, you've asked an interesting question. But first I'm just going to just talk about these birds. These birds are coming downstream of where the kill is, simply because the smell is attracting fish. Both birds, the gray heron in the back and the yellow billed uh, stalk in the front, are fishing. They're taking a little bit of a chance to out now, looking to catch a fish that is attracted by the feeding of the crocodiles and all the detritus that is coming off of them. Now, Taryn, you wanted to know who would win, a crocodile or an alligator? That is a very, very good question there, Taryn. Um, I don't have much, uh, I don't have much uh, knowledge on alligators. I know they've got a stronger bite uh, per kilogram than a crocodile. I know they are virtually identical in all else, um, with the exception that the Nile crocodile can get a little bit bigger in terms of weight, as far as I know, although you're welcome to correct me on that, Taryn. Um, but of course, what we're not talking about is the saltwater crocodile of Australia. And Indonesia, that is the heaviest crocodile and the largest crocodile in the world. And because of that, I'm going to make the statement here that in general, crocodiles, without being too specific about what exact species, would trump alligators in a fight simply because they are bigger and heavier. So I hope that makes some sense to you there, Taryn. Now, Tula Ann, who's only five years old, hello Tula Ann, you wanted to know, do crocodiles bite each other? Tula Ann, absolutely, they do bite one another, they slash at one another with their teeth, and quite often you see crocodiles with bite marks on their snouts and on their heads and on their flanks from other crocodiles, and they do that just to assert dominance. If you've been watching this for a little bit, you would have noticed that a very big crocodile just now opened up his mouth and made a slashing attempt at another very big crocodile, and that is just to assert dominance. There will be a hierarchy, and what that means is there will be a boss of this particular pond, and this boss will have the first pickings of all the choice morsels that come down here. But he needs to make sure that everybody else understands that he's the boss. And if he doesn't do that, another big crocodile will take that throne from him. So it's a precarious position. It's a position that changes from time to time, depending on what crocodile is the biggest, what crocodile is the fittest, what crocodile is the strongest or the cleverest. Oh, this is just such a fantastic sight. Now, Ruby, you're a new viewer. Welcome, Ruby. Welcome to Safari Live. I'm sure everyone will welcome you throughout the afternoon. You wanted to know if the crocodiles got too close to these birds, would they consider eating them or would they be able to eat them? Absolutely, Ruby. Uh, crocodiles are opportunistic. They are carnivorous to a fault. Have a look at this crocodile coming in here. And they will absolutely eat birds. Now, it's funny that a crocodile about a half a meter in length, so about one and a half feet to about three feet in length, will eat birds, fish, and insects as the majority of its diet. As it gets bigger, that look at this, coming in, coming in, it's going to make a snap at it. Oh, no, that bird has seen a crocodile before. Almost, Ruby, you almost got your wish over here. That crocodile's probably at just over three or four feet. Now, they will eat insects below three feet, majority insects and fish, then from three feet to about the size of these crocodiles here, mainly just fish. And then when they get to these giant old crocodiles that you're watching in the distance over there, these crocodiles are absolutely just meat eaters, which gives them the largest intake of calories and protein for the least amount of effort. Now, are we watching what happens to the rest of this wildebeest buffet? I'm going to be sending you over to, I think, Brent. I'm not too sure. Perhaps Brent has finally found some signal. And uh, we're going to see you in a little bit. Well, here we go with one of the most beautiful and biggest antelopes in Africa, the eland. Now, they range all through the Mara Serengeti system, but we do have a particular fondness for this herd that hangs around the area below our camp. Now, eland are one of these 100% live, and I would love to hear from you. So let me know what you think, or if you have any questions, by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And you can hear an aeroplane overhead taking uh, some lucky guests either in or out of uh, one of the fantastic lodges that are all through the Maasai Mara. But now, I think we're going to have, we had such a good morning. Uh, we had lions, we had wildebeest, we had zebra, we had crocodiles, and uh, we had a few bird species. Now I know quite a lot of our regular viewers are itching to get to 50 bird species. There he is, sitting atop of the shepherd's tree. 
There we go. You can hear him calling. You can see him calling. And a very a drab little bird, but he does have a, a slightly reddish cap um, that extends when he's trying to impress the ladies. Well, let's leave the little Rufus named Lark and see what other... Now, James is wondering about the social structure of Eland. Uh, it differs slightly uh, from some of the an other antelope, James. Now, uh, they will be in loose female herds, and there will be territorial... Well, sorry, not territorial bulls, dominant bulls. Now, Eland are not as territorial as certain animals, they tend to move and have seasonal migrations between different areas. So you can have multiple large bulls in a herd and they will fight for the right to breed when a female is in estrus. Other than that, you, will often, you can often find females uh, without any dominant males around and it could just be that there are no females in estrus at that point. Now they also breed throughout the year, they are not seasonal breeders. Oh, here we go, for the birders we've got the yellow-billed ox peckers on that young eland. I just really love that sort of reddish colour on them. And uh, they are part of the Trafalegid family as a young boy. Now, Trafalegids are spiral horned antelopes. And uh, you can see that twisty horn. Now, Elands are by far the biggest of the spiral horned antelope. Um, with a